we've got to get more doses out as quickly as we can. And like you said, this is a matter of national security for the U.S. We are starting to go through the fourth surge in the U.S. driven by the Delta variant, which is happening because we did not do enough to end the acute phase of this pandemic around the world. We're going to see the next variant and the next variant every three, six months. And God help us when the next variant is actually going to pierce the vaccine mediated immunity, because now we're going to go back to scratch. Uh, and that is most certainly a national security issue. And it's an economic issue. Our economic recovery is not going to happen. And our economic growth is not going to happen as quickly if the rest of the world is off fighting a pandemic. Who are we going to sell our goods and services to? Who are the customers around the world? So whether you want to take a self-interested view and say what's in our national and economic security, or what's the right thing to do, or what's the humanitarian response, the answer is the same. And that's what makes the response so easy. Like everything points to that work we have to do. In this week's program, our moderator and panel will help us understand the complex issues facing and governing the global response to the pandemic to date, the prospects for getting it right in the future, and how COVID-19 is shaping geopolitics in the changing world. It is now my pleasure to introduce Christina Coolidge, a faculty member in the Political Science and Legal Studies Department at Suffolk University. Christina. Thank you, Susan, and welcome everyone to this, the second episode of our second edition of Politics in the Era of Global Pandemic, our survey course for everyone. As you know, I'm really excited to be able to share with our students experts' opinions and some pr prognostication from around the world based on a variety of different themes. And I'm also thrilled to be able to invite a general audience into the classroom, continuing Suffolk's historic mission of access and opportunity. So tonight's focus really is on the issue of vaccination progress globally rather than locally. We've got lots of lots of problems with vaccination rates, but one of the most stark is the difference between, and we have a map here that actually says it better than I can tell you, that there is very, very unequal progress in terms of getting people fully vaccinated. So as you can see, the colors on this map, the dark blue, those are the areas where the most vaccination has happened. And the pattern is clear. Most of the world is not vaccinated. There are very few places that are. As a matter of fact, the upshot of all of this is that as of today, only 1.1% of those people who have received vaccinations, full vaccinations in the world, are in low and middle income countries. So this really is a stark income and access issue. Um, here are today's numbers from the WHO in terms of total numbers of confirmed cases of coronavirus and numbers of deaths. So to date, we are now north of 4 million cases, 4 million deaths that are due to confirmed cases of COVID. We know that's an undercount. So even though some of us who are privileged enough to have already received vaccinations are beginning to feel like we are coming out of the teeth of this, the global picture is very different. Tonight, we have an excellent panel of people who can speak to this much better than I, and a fabulous moderator, Elise Labat. Elise, I'm gonna kick this over to you to get the conversation started. Thanks a lot, Christina, appreciate it. And thank you to everybody for joining us. I wanna thank the, uh, I wanna thank GBH and the Ford Hall Forum and Suffolk University. Um, and I'd like to introduce my panel. To so here, I mean left his career as an attorney in intellectual property to co-found the Initiative for Medicines Access and Knowledge, or IMAC, which seeks solutions to address structural inequity in the medicine system. 
Dr. Krishna Yudakumar is the founding director of the Global Health Innovation Center at Duke University, where he studies global health innovations and policy reforms. And some of those slides that we're going to say are data visualizations um, that have been uh, provided by Duke and um, Krishna. And Abby Maxman is the is the president and CEO of Oxfam America, where she leads the effort to challenge policies and systems that permeate global po global poverty. And I've done a lot of work with uh, Oxfam and, and have been um, on uh, panels with Krishma before and, and to here as a new friend. So really looking forward to your questions. We have some great student questions for our panelists a little bit later. And we're looking for your questions as well that you can put in the Q&A box. Um, Krishma, let's start with you. Let's talk about the inequality of vaccines. Um, we were, I wanna uh, put, put on one of these dramatic charts of yours um, that shows the inequity of vaccine and purchases of vaccine by country. Let's, let's take a look at that and discuss it a little bit. Now you've said that in 2020, many high income countries have kind of hedged their bets by purchasing enough doses to vaccinate their population seven times over even before any of the candidates were approved to get those doses as quickly as possible. And, and you know, those direct deals made by high income and, and some middle income countries mean that a smaller piece of that pie is available for low and middle income countries and for you know, more of these global partnerships like COVAX in 2021. Talk to us a little bit about what that, that um, chart shows. Sure. Thank you very much, Lisa, and thank you for the opportunity to, to join you today. You're right. So when we go back over a year to understand we were in the midst of this pandemic, we didn't really understand totally what was going on. The state of play was totally different than what a normal market might look like. Usually you see a need, somebody, whether it's the public or private sector, develops a product, it could be a vaccine or a drug, and then people buy it. What happened here? was actually the opposite, that people made bets on products before they were ever real. So way back in May of 2020 was the first purchase agreement that was done. So we had initiatives like Operation Warp Speed in the US. We had COVAX that was stood up as a global multilateral effort to, to aggregate demand around the world and make investments into research and development. So we deployed tens of billions of dollars to try to develop vaccines as quickly as possible and at the same time, people were putting additional tens of billions of dollars to buy access to those vaccines without knowing if they would ever work or not. So not surprisingly, the richest countries, the high income countries around the world had the most money and the most willingness to take risk. So they got to the front of the line before there was ever a line or before the store was open and were able to make sure that their investments paid off in access for their own populations to vaccines. And what we have seen happen because of that is high income countries that make up about 16% of the world's population have purchased more than 50% of all of the vaccines that have been spoken for. And that happened not just in purchases, but obviously we've seen the data on what's actually happening with vaccine distribution and implementation. So around the world, we've got an average of about 13% of the world's population that's fully vaccinated. In North America, it's 36%. And across the entire continent of Africa, it's actually less than 2% of the population. So the structures that we were building from in the midst of a burgeoning pandemic baked in a lot of the inequities that we're seeing now. And we have to work that much harder to undo them. Um, Tahir, weigh in here and talk to us about um, the roles of the U.S., the EU, the U.K., and other wealthy, wealthy nations that have been hoarding vaccine supplies to date and, and how political this is. Yes, and thank you, Lisa, and thank you for having me join this uh, panel and my esteemed colleagues. Uh, the, currently, the, the big battle that's playing out uh, in terms of who can actually manufacture these vaccines is playing out at the World Trade Organization. And this concerns uh, the uh, intellectual property ownership that goes into the vaccines. Um, so whilst, on the other hand, as Krishna has rightly pointed out, you've got uh, the rich countries that are securing their investments and in first in queue to get these vaccines, they're also preventing others from actually manufacturing them. Uh, instead, relying on donations, 
or some sort of uh, licensing deals which don't allow other manufacturers to make the vaccine, but to merely be sort of uh, warehouse packages and fill and finish the actual vials. Uh, and and at, at the moment, you know, this, this South African government, the Indian government, has, uh, supported by some 60 other uh, member states of the World Trade Organization, mostly from lower middle income countries, have actually put a proposal in October 2020 uh, asking for the waiver of intellectual property so that other manufacturers uh, who might have the capability can actually make these vaccines. But unfortunately, despite the US uh, historically going against what it normally does, supporting such a way, but at least for vaccines, uh, the Europeans are actually now holding everything up. And there was just a meeting yesterday at the World Trade Organization, uh, at the TRIPS Council, which is the agreement under the World Trade Organization that governs intellectual property. Um, the Europeans are essentially trying to put a proposal which is really sucking space out of the room and preventing any progress. And that's why we're not going to get anywhere near, in my opinion, to getting out of this pandemic because uh, the pharmaceutical companies supported by rich country governments are actually uh, holding us all back. I want to get to that commercial element and the, and the um, pharmaceutical companies in a bit and also um, a little bit more about the politics. But Abby, let's talk about this inequity a little more and the kind of juxtaposition of the vaccinated to the unvaccinated um, and then the weaknesses that are exacerbating this fragility and stability and poverty. Yeah, thanks, Elise. And it's really great to be with you all to hear in Krishna. Uh, and, and to underline points already made, you know, we, we're really at a crucial inflection point in this pandemic. We, we see two worlds, a world split in two. You saw it on the maps. A world where we in the vaccinated North and Global North, uh, we're going back to our lives because of highly effective vaccines and a world where the coronavirus continues to have the upper hand, killing many still every single day. We're hearing about variants uh, and it's happening in, in rich countries like ours in the US. We're enjoying a back to normal summer. Uh, many around the world are fretting about whether they're gonna survive the summer. And you know, with this inflection point, despite having multiple safe and effective va vaccines available to combat COVID-19, what is lacking at the moment is the political will to increase the supply and facilitate their distribution to everyone everywhere. And it is possible uh, because, and we also know that everywhere, everyone, <laughs> no matter where we are, no matter how wealthy or poor, really needs to have the chance to get vaccinated and protected against the coronavirus. And, you know, this is a crisis of many things. It's a health crisis, it's an economic crisis, it's a social crisis, and frankly, above all, it's a moral one. Because we can turn the trajectory of this when every government around the globe has enough vaccines for their population. And as uh, Tahir was just saying, know-how and technology must be shared so that more countries and more uh, companies are willing to share their, uh, their uh, know-how so that everywhere uh, the vaccine can be produced. Uh, we know the numbers that have just been talked about, uh, you know, less than 1% of the population in Africa, 10% around the world, well, almost half of Americans have been fully vaccinated. And this really is a pandemic that needs to be defeated globally. It requires a global effort and solidarity. And as we've all heard over and over, and we're seeing it play out. No one is safe until everyone is safe. It's true. And, and you and I were talking about how um, the other day, how a lot of these crises, these political, these social, these economic crises are, are fueling so much of that um, instability around the world. Um, and I'm writing about that actually this week for Foreign Policy. Krishna, let's talk about the role of US leadership and, and the whole idea of whether we should be giving countries bilaterally, President Biden has promised to give out, you know, some 80 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines to 50 countries. That's been going a little bit slower um, than he hoped because of logistical issues. Um, he met with G7 leaders in Europe and, and is really kind of setting this goal of vaccinating the world by 2020, 2022, excuse me. Um, talk to us about how um, this is going bilaterally versus multilaterally through um, organizations like COVAX 
Um, and how does that compare with countries like China and Russia who are, who are just donating millions of doses in terms of trying to use this vaccine diplomacy? Sometimes they appear less effective in preventing outbreaks and, and variants, but, but they're still getting that kind of di diplomatic soft power bump because they're, they're doing it um, in a much more ad hoc way. Yeah, thank you. I'd say, you know, the U.S. has for too long been missing in action and taking a leadership role. We have not seen in prior crises a successful global health response without the U.S. playing a leadership role. Yes, through bilateral and multilateral channels, um, but they have to step up. And even with um, the Biden administration, they're starting to say the right things. They've done some of the, the things that are necessary in terms of engaging with the World Health Organization, engaging with COVAX, uh, making pledges of donations. But frankly, we're still seeing too little too late relative to what can be done and what should be done. So we need to see the US and the G7 and others, including the G20, really step up to show leadership both to support COVAX, which has been fragile, right? The goal has been to get 2 billion let's doses out. The audience, let's explain to the audience what COVAX is and the various kind of partnerships that are out there. What is COVAX? Absolutely. Yeah, good question. And uh, so uh, a year and a couple of months ago, as we started to recognize this, uh, this pandemic was real and was gonna have global significance, the World Health Organization brought groups together and along with Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, as well as CEPI, an organization called the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, those three organizations co-created this, um, this platform called COVAX. And it was really intended to do a couple of things. First, it was supposed to be the mechanism by which we could get vaccines and financing to the poorest countries in the world. So the 92 poorest countries, all of the low income countries and most of the lower middle income countries could access vaccines because they couldn't go out and buy them on their own. Uh, and we could use donor aid to make sure that those vaccines were getting there. And secondly, more aspirationally, it was hoped that if we created a global platform that every country, including rich countries, would, would pool their resources and co-invest and then they could be allocated uh, doses much more equitably. Now, the first part of that has worked better than it ever has in history. Uh, COVAX has sent out about 130 million doses of vaccines uh, to more than 125 different countries around the world. So saying the bar is better than we've ever done is a really low bar. So to give you context, that's 130 million doses that have gone out to 130 countries relative to about 3.7 billion doses that have been administered. So it's a really, really small percent. Uh, so there's room for improvement without a doubt. The second part of COVAX, you know, let's all create this global solidarity and the US would buy vaccines through there. Uh, that has not worked at all. So what happened was most of the high income countries said, yes, we're gonna support COVAX, we'll give you some money and we'll prop it up. And at the same time, we're gonna go out in the open market and buy doses ourselves. Uh, and so it created uh, really a, a competition where we were saying, yay, COVAX, um, here's a you know, billion dollars. And at the same time, we're gonna go purchase 1.2 billion doses to make sure Americans are protected. Yeah. So um, you know, it's, it's been a challenge. And it's, it's true, as you say, I mean, I remember when this started and, and this was under the Trump administration, but like that you say that the U.S., there's never been a health crisis where the U.S. wasn't in the lead. And I remember during the Ebola crisis even or um, SARS, like the U.S. was there kind of rallying the international community and combating it. And it's kind of a little bit unnatural to not see the U.S. kind of really driving this and, and you know, has the technology, the talent, the organizational capacity to hear, let's talk, we've talked about vaccine supplies, but let's talk about um, the, the waiver on producing vaccines and the politics involved about intellectual property um, and why um, this isn't really equitable because they're not, you know, if we were to give, and, and I want Abby to weigh in too, after you, if we gave countries the technology and the intellectual property to manufacture their own, 
um, this would go a lot quicker and there'd be a lot more supply, right? Well, that's the theory and it actually has happened if you look at other global health crises. For example, I'm not comparing vaccines to antiretrovirals, but in the late 90s, early 2000s, just sort of six years after the World Trade Organization TRIPS agreement, which is the intellectual property agreement, came about and was signed, uh, South Africa was going through a huge crisis with uh, HIV and dr drug prices and antiretrovirals were $10,000 and uh, South Africa couldn't access it, couldn't afford it. And uh, it actually was going to try and use a provision that is legally allowed in the uh, World Trade Organization agreement, the TRIPS agreement, to actually override those patents and uh, bring generic versions in. And uh, 40, some 40 pharmaceutical companies sued the South African government saying basically this was a breach of the World Trade Organization agreement. And I just wanna go back to uh, Krishna's point, and, and this might sound controversial, for the Western audience. Bring it. Uh, you know, the US has been at the forefront of preventing an equitable health system by pushing for the World Trade Organization. You have to look at the history of how this agreement came about. It was actually concocted by the likes of Pfizer and the big copyright industries in the 70s. And it was forced upon the developing countries, the low and middle income countries, uh, which is a, the way I prefer to say it. And these were countries that were coming out, many of them coming out of colonialism in the 60s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. And it was actually put to the UN uh, General Assembly back in the 70s, there was a new international economic order, where they said they wanted tra tra transfer of technology. This is in 1974, there's a resolution out there, which speaks very much to the issues that have been playing out today. But instead of actually getting technology transfer, they got the TRIPS agreement because the CEO of Pfizer back then foresaw the competition that was gonna come from many of the manufacturers in the global South. So instead, they flipped the whole narrative on its head, inserted intellectual property into trade agreements, which had never been done before. And now we are in a situation where these lower middle income countries are actually asking again, let us do this by ourselves if we can, or give us the technology to make us capable to do it. And instead, what we have is a dependency uh, global political economy, which is is, is getting worse and worse by the day. And, you know, people talk about this being a health crisis. This is a global political economic crisis. And this has played out for the last 30 years. And I get it, you know, people are concerned about China and other actors. Of them. It's, it's basically, it's stymieing us from dealing with the biggest crisis. And, you know, any, for those of us who are living in New York, who looked at the haze last night that was uh, enveloping. If we cannot oh, even sort I'm, out, right. if we cannot even sort out this, then God help us when it comes to climate crisis. And I've been involved in conversations about intellectual property around climate technology. And I tell you, it's far worse even then. So the issues are really deeper than just health. And I have to say for anybody touting, you know, the Western world as being leaders in this, I think you have to look at the history. It's a great point. Um, just very quickly, we're using some terms kind of interchangeably global South and global North. Explain to us when we use these terms, um, what we mean by that, because some people say developed countries, less developed countries. Explain what Global North and Global South is. Yeah, Global North are usually the rich industrialized countries, uh, essentially Europe. Uh, the North Developing North. world, developed world. Developed, what is termed developed, economically developed, I like to say. I sometimes say the, the developed world is spiritually underdeveloped. That's, That's a good point. World. Um, but, you know, and, and then the developing economically, you know, these are terms used by the World Bank and so forth. Uh, these are usually the lower middle income countries in you know, the African okay. continent, Asia, you know, countries that are emerging economically and still trying to find their way. Uh, and hence are trying to uh, come out of over, you know, the, the years of uh, either colonialism or other uh, political systems that have been put on them. Uh, I'm not trying to say entirely all, the, all this is laid at the West, but if you look at history, you know, it's, it's you're playing catch up and, you know, there's a lot of economists who have written about technological catch up and how difficult it is. And we're in this state now. Yeah, Abby, talk a little bit more about the global fight over a patent waiver at the WTO and, and what Oxfam calls a people's vaccine and for the technology to be shared and manufacturing to be ramped up quickly so that everyone can um, everywhere can access the vaccine. Yeah, thanks, Elise. And just to build on to here's last point, the world trade system has been rigged for rich countries. And, and we're living the results of that today. Uh, you know, and taxpayers in the US have helped fund 
this life-saving science while a handful of corporations have monopoly control and have profited handsomely. Nobody's losing in this. They're not losing, certainly, but we have to put people over profits. You know, vaccines have already produced nine brand new billionaires. Imagine that. What, what, while all, the, all this inequ the inequities in the system run deep and there's more profit going on off of uh, what's happening. So we really must waive the patents of COVID vaccines. We need to end monopoly control and we need to bring about what we've been calling, as you said, Elise, a people's vaccine. And we must welcome more pharmaceutical manufacturer, in, man, manufacturers, especially in the what we just talked about, Global South, in the, the countries that do not have uh, the access, they have the, the ability to produce if they're given the ability to have the materials, the know-how, and so that they can start producing the vaccines needed in their countries, India, South Africa. They have the skills, they have the knowledge and capacities to do so, and they cannot any longer be blocked by a wall of intellectual property rights. So Krishna, you've talked about how um, it's not really only just about vaccines, but distribution and delivery, which is really gonna be the determining factor in whether these dangerous variants emerge um, that could pierce this you know, kind of hard won vaccine immunity. Um, and that we've already seen these unfortunate examples of, of lack of readiness leading to wasted vaccines, inequitable use of the vaccines and um, reliable information getting out to the public, which is, which is that we're headed for what you call a global supply glut, even though um, you know, the vast majority of, of people in the world remain unvaccinated. That's exactly right. So we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that supply is a challenge, has been a challenge. There are better solutions that we should look at. At the same time, we should also recognize that in the next three to six months, we're going to reach an inflection point where supply is gonna pick up significantly. Even COVAX, that as I mentioned, from the beginning has only gotten about 130 million doses out. Just through COVAX, we're expecting 400 million doses a month by the fourth quarter of this year. So supply is gonna pick up in three or at least by six months. It's not soon enough, but we are not ready around the world to be able to distribute and deliver them and ensure that there's vaccine confidence and that we're dealing with misinformation and everything across the board. So in the same way that we've all been raising a flag about supply for the last year, we're already too late in making the investments and building the capacity to ensure that every country is ready for vaccines to be delivered and that they have the systems in place, that they have the vaccinators, that they have the data, the supply chain, all of the things that are necessary. And what we've seen is that supply is really hard, but the delivery and distribution is actually an even harder problem. And I'm really concerned that six months from now, we're going to see hundreds of millions of doses of unused or wasted vaccines, while we're still at coverage rates in the 20 to 30 percent in most low and middle income countries. And to be clear, this is not in any way saying we should hold off on supply until somebody gets ready. We should absolutely do everything that's humanly possible to increase supply, but it can't be just one or the other. We've got to do both as quickly and as aggressively as we can. And you've, you've also said that vaccine hesitancy, which obviously we're facing a huge crisis with this here in the United States, continues to be a major and persistent barrier in many countries, even as much as supply is. Yeah, and you know, there's some optimism that there was just a, a paper released this week that looked at vaccine acceptance across 10 low and middle income countries. And in every one of those 10 countries, vaccine acceptance rates were actually higher than in the US. So greater or equal to 65% acceptance, which is a very good starting point. And we can continue to work on that because at the end of the day, we have to vaccinate as many people as possible. So the same way that we're trying to reach every person possible in the US, we need to be doing the same in every low and middle income country too. Um, to hear, talk about the influence of the Gates Foundation um, in terms of helping develop the vaccine, helping um, deliver the vaccine. They've been such a 
um, and Bill Gates in particular has been just such an important um, factor in, in kind of highlighting the inequity of, of vaccine uh, development. Yeah, I think if you look at the history uh, uh, of the Gates Foundation's involvement in vaccines, they've done a significant amount of work in the area, particularly for um, low and middle income countries uh, and, and for tr uh, treating vaccines that weren't otherwise there. But when you look at what happened and what played out, and again, I'm, I'm got, unfortunately, a lot of this hasn't been very transparent. Uh, when you, the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine, so Oxford had developed this vaccine, uh, it partners with, uh, it was actually talking about doing an open license where it was going to give it out to as many manufacturers in an open license way. They'd, they'd give the knowledge. But then somehow uh, reports show that uh, the Gates Foundation got in there and suggested that they tie it with AstraZeneca. And then AstraZeneca then tied up with uh, one of the biggest manufacturers, or if not the biggest manufacturer of vaccines uh, in, in, in India, Serum Institute. But what they didn't do is, and, and this is kind of... Uh, pretty amazing that they didn't even think about it. They just went with one manufacturer to a serum. They didn't even give it to, they didn't get AstraZeneca to give it to as many uh, uh, manufacturers in India as possible. It's only afterwards, once India's uh, COVID situation blew up, exports from India were stopped. Serum could only, you know, was actually just trying to serve its Indian market and not, because serum actually is serving COVAX majority, you know, the majority and, and the African continent. So in a way, I think the Gates Foundation has a lot of responsibility in actually stymieing production by, yeah, uh, yeah uh, at least that's, that's an opinion that's out there. And I think it, it adds up. What they should have done was the Gates Foundation, if they were really interested in trying to get as many manufactured in as possible, they should not have got, they should have been, if they were involved with Oxford and AstraZeneca and getting that deal together, they should have been saying, because we put a lot of money in this, you have to be getting as many supplies in, not just syrup. So something in there that we don't know about that is non-transparent, that they only went with one manufacturer. And when India's crisis uh, blew up, uh, India wasn't exporting. As a result, COVAX wasn't getting the supplies that it wanted. And now all of, all of a sudden we're now seeing some uh, manufacturers of the AstraZeneca vaccine in Thailand and a few other places, but it's way too late. So whatever happened at the beginning really screwed things up to put it mildly. Yeah, I mean, the whole idea of kind of mode, profit motive, innovation um, really um, you would think at a time like this in a global pandemic, you wouldn't have to be. Well, I just, may, may I add, Elisa, you know, Bill Gates himself was against the intellectual property waiver. And you have to remember, Bill Gates profited off the World Trade Organization as a copyright mogul. He built his entire wealth through the World Trade Organization agreement. And yet he's telling the global South countries or, you know, the low and middle income countries, no, IP is not the issue. Go figure that out. Yeah. Something to think about. Um, Abby, um, we're going to move to student um, questions in a minute. But before I do, I want to talk about the difficulties of fighting coronavirus in poor countries with already kind of failing health systems, lack of clean water. Um, you're not administering vaccines, but you're on the ground and providing medical assistance to or, or you know, so, uh, humanitarian services to a lot of these countries. Talk about um, you know the the kind of threat of these mutations continuing to threaten our vaccines when you're dealing in these systems in these failing health systems. Yeah, thanks, Elise. Uh, you know, the last I, I think we all can start by imagining what uh, it has been like for every one of us over the past year and a half. It's been really hard, and then take it to a new level. Imagine <laughs> attempting to social distance in a tent in a refugee camp with no running water. Imagine you had no access to healthcare to speak of. We know that the, the health infrastructure has been underfunded and during COVID there's been shifting of resources away from those as the focus shifted to vaccines and other type of emergency assistance and, and no luxury of social, social distancing. And so for us at Oxfam, we've been uh, working over the uh, the past year and a half, and actually decades, but you know, while while millions of people are living in in refugee camps, you know, some only have one water tap that gets used by 250 people. Do you remember at the beginning when we were all washing our hands frantically all the time? Oh, I mean, for 20 seconds, and you know, that that's a privilege that what the people we work with, um, you know, don't don't have, and. Uh, there's the hygiene, the access to 
uh, living space, et cetera. You know, it's been really difficult. And as usual in a crisis of such magnitude, it is the poor who suffer the most and COVID has really been no exception. So this inequality has run deep. Uh, the uh, lack of investment that, that could have been uh, invested in is really showing up. It's being manifested at this time. And during the crisis, we at Oxfam work to help more than 14 million people in almost 70 countries. We've collaborated with more than 700 lo local organizations providing a range of support where it's needed. Food assistance, clean water, hygiene, public health information, uh, soap, you know, whatever is needed in, in a specific case. And, uh, you know, this suffering that we've all seen, we've seen unbelievable suffering and at the same time, and the encouraging thing about this, we have seen unimaginable resilience. And that is yep. really why uh, that this moment is so crucial. We must end the mutations and this boomeranging around. We're seeing it manifest now. And there's an opportunity to call for real change and to call for this people's vaccine. Oh, thanks, Abby. Um, we're gonna go to some students now who will join with some questions for our panelists. Um, Kaylee Lavoie has a question for Abby. Kaylee, the floor is yours. Thank you, Elise, for the introduction. My name is Kaylee, and I am an incoming freshman at Suffolk University. I will be studying media and film with a concentration in production. It's great to have panelists here discussing such a prevalent topic. My question is for Ms. Maxman. On a global scale, women have been disproportionately affected in terms of the workforce and economic inequality. The problem this problem has only increased because of the pandemic. What are some things governments can do to address this issue? Kaylee, thank you so much for the question. You know, indeed, women and girls experience emergencies differently and COVID-19 has been no exception. Women are likely to be hardest hit by the economic elements of the crisis as they are always disproportionately represented in low paying and insecure jobs that really offer few protections such as sick leave. Uh, you know, we recently at Oxfam estimated that the COVID-19 crisis cost women around the world at least $800 billion in lost income over the last year. That's equivalent to more than the combined GDP of 98 countries. And it's important to note that unpaid care has increased dramatically during the crisis and much of it uh, collapsing on whose shoulders? Women's shoulders. That short, cha short changes women's economic opportunities and, and career tracks. I know we've all read about the changes and impact on, on women and men and families. We know that women do three times as much unpaid work as men and really make up the majority of the world's underpaid uh, care workers. So in our work, Kaylee, we're calling for a feminist response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And that means three big things. The response must be informed by gender analysis that's disaggregated by sex, age, sexual orientation, migrant status, disability, and other intersecting forms of oppression. Second, it really means we must work with and in solidarity with women's rights and feminist organizations. They really need to be at the table. And last, we really must center women and the most marginalized at the heart of policymaking, again, we need to have the right voices at the tables, uh, women in marginalized communities helping inform what is happening uh, and uh, make real change. Thanks so much, Abby, and thank you to Kaylee. Um, Zachary Rodriguez has a question for Tahir. Zach, floor is yours. Thank you, Elise, for having me today. My name is Zachary Rodericks, and I am an incoming freshman at Suffolk University that will be studying law. And my question is for Tahir Amin. There was a clear shift in your career of being a patent attorney to being a passionate advocate on human rights activity. I was curious to what compelled you to stop doing work in that industry from a domestic focus to an international focus. It's a, thank you, Zachary. And uh, it's a great question. Uh, somebody who's, uh, I was, when I remember sort of wanting to be a lawyer and, and uh, sort of uh, reach the sort of heights of the legal career, I, I got into private practice. I thought that was where you really uh, make your mark. And I did it for 10 years. And it was through that practice and acting for large corporations and, and different actors that I saw how the law gets shaped. And 
one of the things that in, in sort of the latter part of those 10 years, I realized that actually it's less about the law, it's who has the deepest pockets. Um, and that for me really stuck with me. And, and it was at that point when I started understanding at, at that time, this was in the late nineties when intellectual property was still a sort of a bit of an unknown, uh, uh, bit unknown in the legal field. It was a sexy subject, but um, you know, you had the TRIPS agreement, the World Trade Organization that had just formed. And the more I read about it and the more I engaged uh, colleagues about it, you know, here I was in, in, you know, in a rich global North country like England, uh, I was actually pushing these laws. I was trying to harmonize these laws in favor of these powerful corporations and also these, these uh, uh, rich countries who were actually benefiting from it. And the more I studied and the more I learned from it, I thought, well, actually, this is not why I got into law for. I thought law was supposed to be about equity. It was supposed to be about justice. And, uh, and so I actually went to India and it was there that I started, I spent a couple of weeks there and I said, well, you know, this really fits what I want to do. I want to bring my practice knowledge because in the public interest side, and certainly on intellectual property, there aren't that many advocates who come from private practice who can lend their skills to uh, really fight for people who don't have a voice in the system. Uh, and it was really, that's what turned in. And India was going through this transformational change because it had just signed uh, it, it signed to the World Trade Organization agreement. It now had to change its patent laws. And India being the home of generic medicine, uh, it supplies some 80% of antiretroviral medicines to Africa, for example. It, that supply was going to get cut off because patents were going to get enforced. You know, we talk about this battle over COVID vaccines. It goes way back. I mean, I've been doing this for 15 years uh, in the public interest sense now. And, and everything we're seeing come to play out now is something we've been fighting for 15 years ago. So that was really the turn. It was like learning that actually patents aren't just, they're a symptom of a global political economy that has been shaped to benefit a few. And, and I said, well, that's not how I want to spend my legal career because I can't live with that. Uh, it's not to say that corporations shouldn't have uh, uh, some skin in the game, whatever, but they have literally taken over the entire system. And, you know, you just have to see the sort of inequities that exist both in the United States, but also uh, globally. Thanks to here and thanks, Zach. Um, Stephen Murnane with a question for Krishna. Go Hi. ahead. Uh, my, my name is Stephen. I'm an uh, incoming junior here at uh, Suffolk University. I just transferred here. Uh, my question is more about uh, the supply of vaccines. So we did talk about vaccine inequity between uh, the global north and the global south and how it's not uh, specifically based on supply. Um, so we know that the COVAX is trying to uh, increase vaccination rates along the global south and that the G7 has pledged uh, like 870 million vaccines, almost a billion. Um, but as we talked about that, the supply isn't the only issue. Uh, so how can we convince legislators here in the U.S. that it's not only a moral dilemma to get these vaccines out, uh, but it's a matter of national security that we not only supply the vaccines to these countries, but also distribute them, get on the ground and distribute them because they don't have the systems in place to do that. Yeah, thank you, Stephen. Um, really important question. Uh, appreciate it. And you're exactly right. So you know, one, on supply, we do have to step up more than we have. So the, the G7 made a commitment. They pulled a number out of the air. They said, we're going to donate a billion doses. They didn't even do the math right to add up to a billion, right? As you said, it only added up in their own press release to 870 million or something. And, and they went back and counted stuff they'd already said they would donate three months before. So uh, it was largely intended to take the pressure off for them to do something. So they said, look, we came up with a big number, leave us alone, which is a, a terrible thing to do. Uh, we've got to get more doses out as quickly as we can. And like you said, this is a matter of national security for the US. We are starting to go through the fourth surge in the US driven by the Delta variant, which is happening because we did not do enough to end the acute phase of this pandemic around the world we're gonna see the next variant and the next variant every three, six months. And God help us when the next variant is actually gonna pierce the vaccine mediated immunity because now we're gonna go back to scratch. Uh, and that is most certainly a national security issue. 
And it's an economic issue. Our economic recovery is not going to happen. Our economic growth is not going to happen as quickly if the rest of the world is off fighting a pandemic. Who are we going to sell our goods and services to? Who are the customers around the world? So whether you want to take a self-interested view and say what's in our national and economic security or what's the right thing to do or what's the humanitarian response, the answer is the same. And that's what makes the response so easy. Like everything points to that work we have to do. Uh, the U.S. right now has hundreds of millions of doses of vaccine that are unused. By the end of July, we will have received somewhere between 600 and 700 million doses of vaccine from Pfizer and BioNTech, Moderna, Johnson & Johnson, AstraZeneca. We have distributed less than 400 million. We have deployed about 340 million. So there are two to 300 million doses today that we're not using. And we know that these vaccine manufacturers are producing hundreds of millions a, a month. So we don't need to keep any on the shelf or in freezers. They need to be going out where they can make a difference today and tomorrow, not in six months. On your second point, you're right. Just flying a plane over and unloading the pallet on the tarmac is not good enough. And unfortunately, all we're seeing are pictures of, of exactly that happening, of planes landing and pictures of, of these pallets being unloaded. We do have to step in. To be clear, we can't take a colonial approach to this to say, let us come in and tell you how to do this. This needs to be owned and, uh, and led locally, but any and all resources we can provide, we should be doing that because it is a, not just our moral responsibility, but also in our self-interest. Okay, Krishna, thanks very much. Um, let's, we're gonna go to um, our audience questions now. We've um, Abby, let's start with you. Um, I think we've discussed the question is, is the Biden administration doing enough to lead getting the world vaccinated? I think we've discussed that we think that it's not, but what should they be doing that they're not? Um, what, what do you think the Biden administration can do right away to help speed up um, getting um, vaccines in people's arms? Yeah, Elise, thank you. Um, and thanks to the audience question. You know, but President Biden really did take the brave, unprecedented step, as was said earlier, of supporting a proposal at the WTO to waive the intellectual property rights. That was that was big. Uh, we don't want to underestimate that. But we knew, and we've heard this tonight, it's just the beginning. President Biden, he really does have the authority and the ability to rally other world leaders to follow on this, uh, and more than a hundred other world leaders in backing the waiver of of the intellectual property for the vaccines at the WTO. And just last week, uh, Chancellor Merkel was in Washington. Uh, and that's a critical blocker in terms of opening up the access uh, in, uh, in Europe and, and the EU. We really must, and he has the ability and power to persuade other WT members to agree to the way to waive patents and we must invest in the manufacturing capacity and know how, how there's so much more that can be done we have to be pulling every single lever uh be it through covax all the systems we've been talking about um in terms of health system strengthening that must be maintained so that we can be moving the supply chain when the vaccines increase. Uh, and there's just a huge array. I think the suite of approaches to keep getting vaccines to people, as you said, into people's arms, getting the supply chains uh, moving and also keeping people alive and healthy in the meantime and supporting government's efforts to do that and uh, local organizations on the ground, women's rights organizations and hearing the voices of what's happening. Um, so Tara, we've discussed a little bit about vax. Did you want to add? Did you want to add something on yeah, that? Yeah, if I may, uh, at least. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, what can the U.S. do? I think that we, it's three months almost since uh, the, the U.S. announced um, that they supported a waiver, albeit a restricted version. It's not the version that the, uh, the, the countries that are sponsoring the proposal want. But, um, and, you know, there are reports now that the, the U.S. is basically playing a sort of sideline position and they're letting the Europeans now just sort of hog the space. And if you, again, I like to look about history. Uh, the US were the ones that pulled in the European and the Japanese into creating the WTO. So they have the ability to put a lot more heat on this situation and they're not doing it. 
if this was the United States and it needed something done at the WTO that served its interest from an economic point of view, you can bet your bottom dollar this would have happened by now. So I don't know whether this is just political sort of headlines or that, you know, a camera shot. I applaud Joe, uh, President Biden for doing this, but he's got to do a lot more because he's not doing it. Uh, and the other thing is, just the thing, there's a lot of public money that went into Moderna's vaccine. In fact, it was mostly uh, sort of paid for by the US government. And just yesterday, uh, uh, the Moderna's market capitalization reached $122 billion. That's your and my taxpayers' money. These CEOs inside management has now sold $1.7 billion of shares. That's, that's ridiculous. That, that is a moral catastrophe that is happening under the watch of the US government. So there's a lot more that they could be doing. They could be actually demanding and compelling Moderna to be sharing that transfer of technology and they're not. So there's a lot more that can be done. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't want to go there. No, that's okay. I'll come back to you on another point, but I want to follow up with Krishna on this. So what's best for overall vaccine production and quality? Preventing generic production to encourage pharmaceutical companies to produce and distribute the vaccine or allowing independent manufacturers to produce their version of the vaccine locally? Like, is it either or, or what do you think? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a complex topic for sure. And I'll, I'll preface my remarks by noting that, you know, we work with lots of organizations around the world. We work with the Gates Foundation that's been brought up in this. We work with the uh, companies in the biopharmaceutical industry. We work with the governments around the world. Um, and in that context, right, the, the World Trade Organization and the TRIPS waiver conversation, I see very much as a long-term discussion, which is very much about power dynamics, exactly to Tahir's point about looking at this historically. Even when the U U.S. trade representative came out with that Biden position, it was always really clear that this was not going to make a difference in the next six to 12 months. That said, that's not to downplay the importance of that issue, but it's to say that that is by no means the, uh, that's not the silver bullet that would have unlocked vaccines in India today uh, or South Africa or Nigeria. Uh, it's something that we need to see in terms of better power dynamics around global governance year after year after year. In the short term, right, we've got to do everything possible. So there are supply chain challenges, right? So everything from export controls that were being put in place, not just in India, but in the US, uh, we have to address uh, how to maximize capacity in manufacturing production uh, around the world, which we've started to do and ramp up. And we do absolutely need to see in three to five years, a much more distributed model. We saw what happened, um, which took too long and cost too many lives in response to the HIV and AIDS epidemic. We can't let that happen again. We are starting to see trickles of things happening in terms of manufacturing uh, capacity investments in Africa, especially um, that needs to continue. So we've got to unlock not just intellectual property, but know-how, the things that live in people's heads about how do you manufacture vaccines. You've got to create supply chains because these things take dozens of, of supplies. These are not to say this is not possible. It's just you've got to do all of these things. You've got to have the human capital, which is imminently feasible to do. And I think really importantly, if we build all this up in the next three to five years, how does it continue? Because the last thing you want is to build all of this up and not have any way to sustainably maintain that idle capacity. So once we get through the acute phase of this pandemic and we don't need five to 10 billion doses produced each year, what's gonna happen? Are those gonna lay waste? In which case that would be a shame of having gone through it to not be able to sustain it. And I've yet to see a, a, a feasible and sustainable model to maintain what we might call this ever warm supply of capacity when it's not needed over time. And we have to solve that to get it right. Um, we've talked a little bit about um, vaccine hesitancy, um, but Tahir, you know, we're seeing so much vaccine hesitancy here in this country, but also around the world, because I think as we've been discussing, you have these grievances of countries and this distrust in their government in many of these fragile states, particularly in the global south before the pandemic. Then the pandemic hits, there's a distrust in government, 
there's these economic um, hardships that countries are facing. And then there's this lack of social cohesion. And that all kind of leads to this vaccine hesitancy um, that kind of permeates society. We're seeing it here, but it's, it's a lot you know, more dangerous in, in fragile states around the world. Um, is it possible to change the minds of a vaccine hesitant? And if so, how? Um, I'm kind of hearing a different point of view. I actually feel that there's, there's more vaccine hesitancy in the United States than there is. Well, I mean, I, I, there is for sure, but I think that, you know, um, it might be more dangerous in other countries um, yeah. because the situations are so fragile. That's all I meant. Sure. Yeah. And I mean, I know, for example, you know, my, my, my sort of uh, my mother country, you know, Pakistan, there's, there's been vaccine hesitancy over, you know, reasons to do with Osama bin Laden, you know, basically. Right. What, so, you know, I, I totally understand, but I, I feel uh, that we're, we're so far off from getting even just enough supplies to get the majority of the populations um, uh, sort of uh, vaccinated that, 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 you know, talking about vaccine hesitancy should not cloud the fact that we need to get the, the sort of the most of the job done as much as we can. You know, the United States is barely over 50 percent sort of vaccinated. And, 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 and so why can't we even achieve even that goal in as many of these countries, despite the hesitancy? Because everyone's going to have some hesitancy. Um, and, and so and you know, the, the other point I just wanted to follow up on what Krishna was saying, I think in some circles there is this this, oh, you know, what can we do immediately? I, I want to know what immediately is, because for me, immediately is if some manufacturers can get off the ground in six to nine months, and we spoke to a number of manufacturers in, you know, uh, the global south, and they said if we had, if they had technology transfer, they could probably get up and running in four to six months, and then if they were given the waiver, they could be nine months. Projections show that some countries are not even going to vaccinate their populations until 2023, so I do slightly disagree with this idea, this, this policy talk, that immediately means giving it all to the current uh, actors, and actually then try and solve the larger sustainable issues later. I think actually that's kicking the can down the road. And I think we need to get out of that talk. And yes, there is going to be an issue into how do you keep then these, uh, these plants actually alive then? Because obviously, you know, the investments will go in and then in five years, Christian's absolutely right. But, you know, many, just think about Moderna, they didn't even have a place to actually manufacture these things six months ago. They just created a, a Kodak factory and rebuilt it. You know, many biologic companies in, uh, in, in India, for example, are already retrofitting. They're already retrofitted to make the Sputnik vaccine, the Russian vaccine. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of different ways we can look at this. Uh, it, it, you know, remember the mRNA vaccines, they're not classic sort of uh, cell virus vaccines. They're actually synthetic chemistry with some biological elements. And they're actually speaking to many biologic companies, not the typical vanu vaccine manufacturers easier to retrofit than actually getting all these bioreactive uh, uh, sort of uh, 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 equipment into your, into your plants like you do with typical vaccine. So I think there's a lot of misinformation going on. You know, the, the, the industry has moved the goalposts around so much to try and sort of shift away from all the arguments that have been put up front to kind of wave IP to try and get other manufacturers in. You know, it's a raw, it's raw materials, it's supply issues. No, it's not, there's IP and all of that. South Korea is just saying, actually, we can increase those supply of raw materials for, you know, lipids for mRNA. So there's a lot of gaslighting that's going on. And it's actually, you can't believe anything that's coming from either the rich countries that are opposing the IP or the pharmaceutical companies. I think it's time we actually really started putting some more pressure on this nonsense that's coming out. That's really going to keep us in, pardon my friends, in the shit. That's a good point. Um, Abby, Tahir was talking about the fact that like here you have so much hesitancy here in the United States about the vaccine where the rest of the world, like as we discussed, like 1% of the world is vaccinated in the countries where you're providing services and Oxfam is working. What does the rest of the world think about that? That we have this privilege of getting the vaccine here in the United States and, you know, around the world countries would, you know, would love to have that vaccine. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, it, this is another place where the deep inequities are playing out. And, and you, just, just, you just hit it on the head. Um, people don't even have the choice to have vaccine hesitancy. And as we've seen and have been learning um, that, you know, people are dying from other things. They're not able to get out. You know, when they go into lockdown, they don't have the ability to buy food or earn a living if they're on daily wages. And, you know, at Oxfam, we've also looked at a number of issues that 
uh, we call these other shadow pandemics or viruses, the hunger virus, which is proving now to be more lethal than the pandemic itself. And we've estimated in a recent report that we put out that 11 people are likely dying per minute from hunger now, more than those dying from the virus. And there's this confluence of what we call the three lethal Cs. Conflict, you were just talking about fragility, COVID-19 and climate change together have disrupted food production, driven a 40% increase in food prices globally and pushed over 20 million more people, more people into hunger since the pandemic. So all the gains that have been made uh, over many years towards reducing hunger, to improving health systems, to all the things around the sustainable development goals, we've seen big setbacks since the, the pandemic. And so really what you're talking about is a privileged choice to sh exercise some sort of vaccine he hesitancy. You know, here in the US, people in summer enjoying their time, others thinking about whether or not they're gonna survive. Krishna, after 9-11, um, we saw this kind of reorganization um, in government with the creation of the um, Department of Homeland Security. Um, do you see there being this kind of, um, you know, new processes and new um, attention to developing health systems here in the United States? Um, is health and human services really enough to um, create the kind of health resilience in our systems that, you know, after showing all of these weaknesses, what do you think is going to happen um, once we get our bearings and we're we're kind of in the post COVID era, what happens in the in the U.S. government? Yeah, right. We do need to rethink all of our preparedness and response because, frankly, we haven't done a great job. So if you go back before the pandemic and you look at things like the pandemic, uh, the preparedness monitoring board or the global health security index, the number one and number two ranked countries were the U.S. and the U.K. that have both done abysmally in its in their own response to the pandemic. And what we've seen is that you may have the technical capabilities, but if you don't have good governance, if you don't have the political will, you're going to fail miserably. And we've seen that around the world. Uh, so we do need to think about what changes are ahead. Uh, there's legislation under consideration uh, coming out of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee that includes some, uh, some aspects of governance, of, of who would actually be responsible. Um, there are multiple now... Um, uh, reports, the Independent Panel for Pandemic Preparedness and Response came out with a report. Uh, the G20 high-level independent panel has uh, come out with a report. We've seen um, multiple of these that all are moving toward a model where there has to be a stronger global governance of who's actually responsible. Many of these are moving toward the construct of a new fund that would be um, uh, looking at tens of billions of dollars of preparedness funding and governance and, and everything that's required along the way, it's totally unclear if there's political will to make that happen. You can make the, the calculations on return on investment. It's a total no-brainer that you're going to, you know, if you avoid one of these pandemics, it's trillions of, of dollars saved, much less the lives and, and everything else. So uh, it's really pocket change relative to the insurance that you're buying but it's not clear that we're actually gonna um, come together. This is also told us that, you know, our global governance models have been fragile for many years and this has exposed that. The World Health Organization has very few actual authorities um, that they can try to bring countries together, but they can't actually force them to do anything. They have almost no budget by which to deploy on their own. Uh, so they have to go ask for money every time they wanna do something. So I think all of these, challenges are, are really being borne out now. And it is going to be another uh, really key um, aspect of our response to figure out how we are better uh, prepared uh, and how we can respond better the next time, because surely there will be a next time. Um, and, and Abby, I mean, I think, and, and I want to talk to Tahir about this too. Um, and this is what, you know, I was talking to you about the other day and writing about for this week that you know, we can't, when, when we're thinking about the post-COVID recovery, um, we can't just think of this as a health crisis and we can't anticipate that it's just a health crisis and future shocks we need to anticipate. And we see what's happening around the world in South Africa and Cuba and Haiti with all these massive protests that were kind of exacerbated or, 
you know, fueled by existing grievances that we have to anticipate um, economic, social, and political crises as well. And so, you know, I think it's a lesson to leaders when they're looking at post-COVID efforts that conflict prevention and fragility and resilience need to be baked in the cake. Oh, absolutely, Elise. I mean, we see you've named some of them and we see some of these long standing burning conflicts uh, in uh, South Sudan, Yemen, uh, Ethiopia currently. You know, we know we know that this uh, conflict has a huge impact on people's lives and livelihoods. It's obvious. And we really have to look at ways to uh, prevent and uh, bring warring parties to stop fighting each other. Um, there's pressure points that governments and certainly the U.N. Uh, can can place. Um, but, you know, we see the suffering that's massive um, and it's being done to them. We see the health issues with COVID. We see people people, they're not, necess- they're not starving, they're being starved by conflict, food aid cuts, spiraling food and price inflation, ever-growing inequality, war- warring parties who turn starvation into a weapon in- of war. And so we see this confluence of COVID conflict uh, and, and fueled often by the climate crisis. We need, and we have, with the political will that we've been saying, that some of the, these big issues of our time can be addressed and that can be reversed. Um, Way in here, Tyre, I mean, this kind of toxic cocktail of COVID conflict, um, climate, you know, with the lack of the vaccine, um, you know, doesn't bode well for this kind of next wave of, um, you know, some countries are opening and the opening is getting into full swing and we're, seeing, um, you know, I think we'll start to really feel the full effects of COVID and the non-health effects are gonna outlast the disease while such a huge part of the world is still is still um, in the throes of the pandemic. Yeah, what concerns me is, uh, is, is I feel even in, if, even in the countries that are coming out of the, um, uh, the, the pandemic a little bit with the vaccination race, I still feel we, we're gonna come October be going back down into it again. I hope not, I hope I'm wrong. And, and it's going to be even worse for those countries who are anywhere near vaccinated. But imagine their, their economies and what that's going to do for them. I mean, they're already struggling. And if the longer they stay in that, the harder it's going to be for them to recover. And these are countries that are already struggling uh, to, 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 to sort of uh, climb the ladder of, of uh, economic development. And uh, I feel it's, it's we have to really look at our global systems, our institutions that have been created that really uh, sort of keep this system the way it is. And I'm sure, yes, I understand that there is a political fear of like someone else is gonna take it if I don't get it and all this. I mean, you would think, you know, we talk about evolution, have we really evolved? I mean, I really do philosophically wonder about that. You know, we may have human rights, we may have ways of talking about things in much more equitable ways, but actually on the fundamentals, we are not doing what's really needed. And when climate change comes, which is, is here, I mean, we're living here. Um, it's, it's, it's gonna get much, much more difficult. And it really concerns me, you know, we talk about global pre- uh, pandemic preparedness treaties and you know, the World Health Organization, even before this hit, had said that the current pharmaceutical market model does not serve us in terms of R&D and doing what we need to do. Sure, we got vaccines very quickly, but that's because over $100 billion was injected in by governments, not the market, by governments to get us here. So I really think we need to look at our government systems, our public systems, and what is, is to be a public good, rather than everything being acted out through the private markets, which is, I think, is actually the last 40 years of policy, both in the United States, that's created the big wealth divide and why you have billionaires flying off to the moon, and let's hope they stay there. Um, these are the issues that we really have to tackle. And they're, they're just, they're on every level, we have a crisis of, of, of moral uh, sort of reckoning that I think has been built because of the economic policies. Everything that's happened, so this neoliberal economic policy that's happened over the last 40 years has really put us into a deep hole and it's affecting everyone, not just people in the United States, it's affecting everyone. Um, Krishna, why don't you um, have the last word here in terms of how do we rebuild, how do we build resilience um, into the system so that we can withstand these global shocks 
Um, I mean, as we said, these the pandemic was, you know, shocked health systems that could least afford it, um, but also kind of highlighted these other weaknesses that we kept kind of kicking down the road and deferring and not dealing with. And I mean, if we don't build some resilience in the, to the system, we're never going to withstand the global shock and maybe even more, you know, um, in, in a pickle. <laughs> um, or I was going to say screwed, but because Tahir opened the, opened the floodgates already. So I'm just going for it. Um, that Excellent. We, yeah. Yeah, and I'll, you know, maybe you know, try to end on a note of optimism because we've got lots of challenges to solve. But I, I'd say what we should be really proud of is that science has come through again and again and again. Everything from understanding the basics of the pathogen we were dealing with, the epidemiology, the unprecedented rate of vaccine development, getting diagnostics, hopefully soon to be more effective therapeutics, the science is over delivering consistently. And it's really on us to make sure that we have science-based policy, science-based leadership. The more we can understand and define facts from which to build, uh, the better off we'll be. So it's not as if there's nothing to build on or these are unsolvable problems. We know the science behind what needs to happen. And the other maybe point of optimism is you know, frankly, there's so much room for improvement, right? So let's not let the perfect be the enemy of the good. There are a hundred things we could all do in our lives every day at the level of individual countries, multilaterally. So the more we set ourselves up for a goal and a vision that's centered on equity, there's something that we can wake up and do every single day to make the world a little bit better. All right, well, Krishna, thank you so much. And I want to thank um, my panelists, um, Abby Waxman, Zahir Amin, and, and Chris Yudaida Kamar. Um, and thank you to GBH, Suffolk University, and um, uh, the Freedom Forum. I'm, I'm saying this wrong, but I want to just thank everybody. And thank you to you for watching. I'm going to throw it back to Christina um, to, to close it out. Ford Hall Forum. So sorry. You got it. Live is live. We've live seen it live. all in, in I've Zoom. I've said a lot worse. Panel. <laughs> so thank you, Elise, and thank you to all of the panelists. This was a really, really excellent discussion. And I also want to thank you for answering our students' questions so directly and so well. It means a great deal to give them that kind, of, that kind of respect. I also hope the wider audience is walking away with a balanced view of Krishna's optimism and what really needs to be an awful lot of pessimism because we have an awful lot of work to do. He means you to hear. <laughs> you know, I call it like I see it, but, but there is an awful lot of work to do, not only to get out of the teeth of this pandemic, but as you were just all talking about, to get ready for what will inevitably be the next one. Staying left of boom. And the other thing that I'd also like to say is I really appreciate the conversation about the balance between the ethics and moral responsibility here, the profit motive, and the national security aspects. It's all really, really complicated. So thank you all for sharing your expertise and your time with us tonight.